Good afternoon, everyone. Let's try that again. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our very first webinar for the year. Today we're covering the development of a ride quality index for heavy vehicles based on driver comfort. And our presenter, of course, is Ulysses. Ulysses is based here in our Melbourne office at Arl. And we're just going to run through a few housekeeping slides with you before we get into the content. Uh, my name is Angela Juhas and I'll be your friendly um, moderator, if you will, today. Uh, if you do have any webinar related questions or any questions, in fact, on our knowledge transfer program here at ARB, I would be your point of contact. The webinar today will run for approximately 30 minutes uh, with about 20 minutes left for questions. Now, please don't wait until the end to ask your questions. Obviously, uh, the webinar will be more interactive and enjoyable if you ask them as you go. And of course, Ulysses will endeavour to answer them as we go. If we do run out of time, ladies and gentlemen, we will get back to you on your questions. We are also recording today's webinar. So the link to the recording will be sent to you in an email as well as a PDF version of the presentation material. So you don't have to worry too much about taking notes today. A couple of functions of the GoToWebinar program. Uh, as you see here, we have a questions box and we ask that you please type your questions in here if you have something to ask Ulysses. And now without further ado, I will introduce Ulysses and get him to start his presentation. Welcome Ulysses and thank you for kicking off our webinar program for the year. Oh, you're welcome and uh, good morning everybody. So today I'm going to be talking to you about this development of the Heavy Vehicle Roughness Band Index. This was a project which uh, started uh, quite a few years ago, um, so it has been a couple of years since uh, the report went out. So um, I'll be uh, trying to remember all the details of exactly what went on within the project, but I do remember it was definitely a very interesting opportunity because it was really the, the first major project which um, I was able to take charge of in my time here at ARB, and so it was certainly a, a great experience. And so hopefully I'll be sharing with you today some of the uh, interesting things that we found in the course of um, the project. Wonderful. Well, we look forward to hearing more about it. And without uh, further ado, we might kick off today's webinar with a poll question. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in a moment you will see a box pop up on your computer screen. And what we'll get you to do is answer either yes, no or unsure to the question. And once you've submitted those answers, they'll come through at our end. I can see now that everyone's voted. Thank you for getting your votes in so quickly and I will close the poll off and share those results with you. So it looks like we have 75% uh, of our audience has said that they haven't heard of this project previously. So I'm sure they're interested and, and really keen to learn more Ulysses. So I'll hand back over to you to um, let us know a little bit more. Oh. Yeah, the result's not surprising um, as you'll see as we explained it further, because this um, project was really just uh, the beginnings, if you like, of an effort to really uh, answer a question about how to really measure um, ride quality using driver comfort uh, as the measure. And so we'll hear more about that now. So uh, the purpose of this project, as you can see, was to find out what's the best way to measure um, road roughness uh, as experienced by heavy vehicles for use in triggering pavement rehabilitation. Um, as you may be aware, there's been a long history of trying to develop uh, a ride index for heavy vehicles. We've had since the, uh, the 50s or 60s the um, IRI, the International Roughness Index, which works very well for cars. But to date, there has not really been a really strong candidate for something equivalent for heavy vehicles. And so this project in many ways was yet another attempt to develop uh, another index or at least more understanding about um, all of the factors that go into a uh, heavy vehicle ride. And so one of the things, or the main, I suppose, the two-pronged kind of question we were trying to answer was that um, how do existing measures uh, perform in assessing the ride quality of a heavy vehicle as experienced or through the experience of the driver? Um, and if those approaches are, or indexes are inadequate, 
can we develop a new approach, can we develop a new index? And so just a bit of background, um, the reason why there is a need is because cars and trucks are different. As you can see there from the, um, the diagrams that the, the two trucks which are shown have a much longer wheelbase length than the car and what this means is they are exposed to different range of wavelengths within the road surface, within the road profile. And another, perhaps more important uh, fact you can see here is that even within heavy vehicles um, there is a difference in the wheelbase, wheelbase length. And so all of that goes into um, how the, the ride of the, of the profile is experienced by the driver. And so what we're looking for is A, to come up with a way of being able to measure the ride quality for heavy vehicles, but then also for different types of heavy vehicles. And so the roughness band concept, just to explain what we're actually talking about there, is that uh, with a lot of other ride quality indexes, they produce a single output for each um, point along the road. As you can see um, here in this diagram at the bottom, we have you know, a measure of roughness where the higher values are rougher, the lower values represent smoothness. So you go from being rougher to becoming smoother. And so what these actual numbers here are, it doesn't matter at this stage, it's just to demonstrate a concept. And so what you're having happening at the top here is you have the elevation, the profile of the road in the right and the left wheel path. And this is then calculated in some way to produce a single value at each point along the road. And that works very well for cars because cars are very, very similar um, in terms of how they respond to the, the road surface. So there's not a great deal of difference in their wheelbase length. Um, although those smart cars that have it around now might be very, very different, but we'll uh, exclude them for the moment. Um, but the, of course the difference between different types of trucks is much more pronounced than you'll have between different types of cars. And so what we're seeing here now is that rather than having a single output, we're producing two outputs from a single road profile. Um, and we've dubbed one of those the leaden heavy vehicle model and one the golden heavy vehicle model. And this is just to indicate that the, the golden, being the more valuable one, is the one which performs better. It's able to uh, handle the variations in the road surface a lot better and then produce a smoother ride as uh, perceived by the driver. The leaden vehicle model, perhaps an older vehicle not in such good condition or of poorer design, is going to mean that the driver experiences a much rougher ride on the same road surface. And so by careful selection of um, these two models, the idea is that every heavy vehicle on the road would fall somewhere in between these two models between the best possible performance and between the worst uh, expected performance. And so the end result would simply be a, a band like this where you have a range of values and then uh, your vehicle, whatever you're assessing for, you can be confident as a road uh, asset manager that all vehicles should fall within this range and then you can use that as a way of um, then or a, a way of informing your, um, your road maintenance strategy. So that's the, the concept of the band and why we're doing a band rather than a single value or line because we're trying to account for all the different heavy vehicle types. And so the way that we approached this was we obviously needed to know what the drivers were experiencing and even though studies have been done which uh, ask drivers for their subjective uh, opinions of how rough a road is, we were really after hard numbers that we could use in our calculations. And so. The way that we did that, you can see on the right there with the, the picture of the driver's seat, we had a seat pad which had in a triaxial accelerometer which measured um, the vibrations in all the dimensions. Um, the vertical vibrations are quite important and are often used in, uh, in indexes such as IRI for example, but for heavy vehicles it's also very important to look at the, the lateral vibrations measured by the y-axis. This is the, um, where the truck rocks from side to side which can happen quite a lot if there's uneven, unevenness in the, the two wheel paths. And even the X uh, axis can be quite important as well because when you have a heavy load on the back, often the vehicle can sort of move forward and back mm -hmm. and that can be very important as well. Um, this diagram on the left here is simply showing you the, all the different levels of like uh, where vibrations are absorbed. The vibrations which come through or enter into the vehicle through the wheels um, from the, the two wheel paths, they're absorbed through the suspension uh, of the vehicle and the tyres as well. And then also the, all trucks, heavy vehicles will have cab suspension and then entering into the body of the cab, finally you have the driver's seat which has its own suspension as well. You can see 
there is all the suspension in the driver's seat. And so what that means is that as the vehicle, sorry, as the vibrations travel through the vehicle, obviously how much they're absorbed is going to be different depending on different vehicles, uh, depending on their design, age, condition, etc. And so these are all factors that would go into the development of those two models, the golden and the leaden vehicle models. And so what we were doing um, in the one part of this experiment, or this project, was that we were wanting to take a number of vehicles out onto the road uh, with the accelerometers in that seat pad and to really see how those vehicles responded to the, uh, the vibrations that they were experiencing to the, to the road profile. And so the first thing we did was we wanted to select a number of vehicles. So we have here very four, four very common vehicle configurations, which everyone would have seen as they travel around on the road. So at top we have a rigid truck, and a rigid truck with a dog trailer, and a semi-trailer, and a VTOL. So this would account for the vast majority of vehicles that you would see on the road. However, in addition to just the simple configuration, there were other things to consider, which was like the suspension type. Most uh, vehicles, um, all the vehicles will have the, the spring leaf suspension, um, but a lot of new vehicles will have the airbag suspension. And so what we wanted to do was to really see, is there actually a difference between those two? That's why with the semi-trailers you see here, we selected one which had the spring suspension and one which had the airbag suspension. And so that uh, was introducing another variation. And then we had one more factor we wanted to include, which was to look at the effect of the load on the vehicle. So finally then we ended up with these eight different uh, configurations or variations we wanted to test. So a rigid truck uh, without a load, and then with the load, and finally adding a loaded trailer on the back. And so we're very curious to see as we go through these variations of empty, loaded, and then loaded with a loaded trailer, how do the vibrations change? Is there any effect? What is the effect of introducing each one of these? Likewise with a semi-trailer, unloaded and loaded, and finally the, the semi-trailer with the airbag suspension, unloaded and loaded, and then adding another um, trailer on the end to produce a DB double. And so we took all eight of those uh, vehicle configurations out on the road, and I spent um, two weeks out near the town of Dubbo to do that. Um, this is an example of what the roads look like out in Dubbo, which gives you a bit of an idea of why we chose this area. The first thing we looked for was we wanted to find roads that had uh, higher levels of roughness. Um, we were really confined to use IRI to indicate that roughness, which as I mentioned is not really the best for heavy vehicles, but we didn't really have uh, much other options. So we found a number of areas which had very, very rough roads. And then I looked for roads which were like this, which were very, very straight, uh, mostly very, very flat, and also uh, didn't have much traffic. And so um, these roads which were the, uh, I just forgot the name of the highway, I can't remember, but the one running east to west through Dubbo, uh, so not the new which runs north to south. Um, this was really providing us with really, really the ideal kind of road. You can see that the speed limit there was quite high as well. And also, this is quite a high quality road. It's got a sealed shoulder as well, which meant that the um, that the experience of the the ride, the drive on this road, we were able to get a, a good variation between roads that were quite smooth nearer the towns, and then the roads a bit further out that were really quite rough. Those areas that we had um, targeted before. So it was giving us a, a really good um, variation of roughness, which is what uh, we were looking for, and in straight stretches as well. And if any of our audience are from Dubbo, please feel free <laughs> to let us know what the name of that highway is, of course. Yes. And so this is some of the preliminary results here. Um, we can see there's a bar there, a column for each one of the, the eight uh, configurations that we tested with all those variables. And so Interesting, interesting thing to note here about this is that you can see that the, the rigid truck overall it performs a lot worse than the the, uh, the articulated vehicles, and that's not unexpected. Um, a lot of these things that we discovered were only what any truck driver could tell you, but the important thing is here is that we were able to find the numbers which are behind it, um, which allows us then to do calculations and produce something useful. And so any truck driver will tell you that a rigid truck performs a lot worse on um, a road than an articulated truck, but here we can see that it's generally about twice as bad. Um, this value here, of course, is the combined uh, root mean square uh, vibrations of the, or the experience at the driver's seat. And so with the comparison between the, the semi-trailer with the, the spring suspension and the airbag suspension, 
you can see that the, perhaps the airbag suspension performs uh, a little bit better. Um, but the changes here are not all that significant. So the amount of change I would not say is huge. Um, and given that this was only like one, one vehicle, another vehicle might have a slightly different range. And so therefore, it's not um, as pronounced a difference as we see here. So based on this, we would say that the differences between the uh, spring suspension and the airbag suspension is not really significant. Although it is interesting that once you add a load to a, a spring suspension semi-trailer, the performance actually gets a little bit smoother as far as the driver is concerned, whereas in the airbag suspension, it actually gets a little bit worse. And that would definitely be a, a result of how the, um, the vibrations or the shocks are absorbed by those two different suspension systems. The spring loaded, uh, sorry, the spring uh, suspension tends to absorb the, the shocks, if you like, bit by bit. So the, the vehicle will tend to bounce along the road a little bit, which causes you know, lots of grief for uh, road asset managers. Um, whereas the airbag suspension tends to absorb it all in one big shock. Um, so that's why some of the, the undulations in the road surface might be experienced a bit more of a bang for the, the truck driver and so you might get some um, a bit more spiky results which could be producing what we see here. Uh, and then finally adding on the, the another loaded trailer, trailer to the, the uh, semi-trailer with the airbag suspension, it produced a bit of a, a, a more uh, less comfortable ride as you can see here but once again that, that amount is not all that significant. So that gives us a general indication that our, our leaden vehicle should be uh, a rigid truck um, with a, just a load but no trailer if you take um, these numbers. And our, our golden vehicle will be by an articulated truck, maybe a, uh, a semi-trailer with, uh, with airbag suspension. So, yes. Uh, so. Um, we might just stop there and uh, give our audience an opportunity to ask some questions if they have any. Remember, uh, please don't be shy. Uh, the more interactive we can make this webinar, the more enjoyable it will be for yourselves. And um, we have actually had one of our audience members let us know that it is in fact the Newell Highway in Dubbo. So thanks very much for that, Ganesh. And uh, keep those questions coming through. Right, so the situation we are facing here um, is that we have a road profile and out of that we want to be able to produce two models, one which represents the best kind of performance that a heavy vehicle can experience on road and one which represents the worst kind of experience. Uh, so being the golden and the leaden model which I referred to earlier. Now even though in this project we were able to put accelerometers on a seat pay in a heavy vehicle, a, uh, a, an asset manager is not going to have that um, because you can't, of course you can't do that all the vehicles. All they're going to have is information on the road profile. And so what we need to do within this black box was come up with a means to be able to take the road profile and then be able to produce uh, an interpretation of what the road profile or the experience of the road profile is going to be in those different vehicle types. So the first thing we did was we wanted to be able to, within this black box, produce a general roughness model, something that will give us an idea of how rough is this road in general. And then we wanted to introduce general modifiers to look at um, the effect of, for example, speed, um, the different magnitude of the, of the vibrations. Sometimes vibrations have the same frequency, but the actual vibrations in terms of the, the heights and the falls in the road surface will be different. And then finally, uh, we also want to know the third one, which was, I can't recall, but we're going to cover it in a minute, so we'll find out then. And finally, the quality, quality modifiers, which are to do with the, I suppose, the individual things which are very relevant to whether it, what produces a golden model or a, uh, a leaden model. So things which may be related to the condition of the vehicle or the age of it, so how it really responds. So the first, the general modifiers I should say are very much about the road and the quality modifiers are about the vehicles themselves. So for the general roughness model, uh, we decided to base this on variance. This is following a lot of work that was done in, in New Zealand where they uh, investigated this quite extensively and um, they decided that variance was a, a good, uh, good indicator of uh, the general roughness of, of a road. And so the way variance works is that you take your, your road profile and then you run a moving average over it. And then you look at the difference between the, the, uh, the road profile, which is shown here in green, and then the moving average, which smooths, smooths the road profile a bit. And then look at the, 
the difference between those two is measured, measured by the black lines here. If a, a row is generally quite smooth already, then the smoothing of it, as produced by the moving average, will not produce a very large difference. Uh, if a road is very rough, then you'll see quite a large difference. And so what we do to produce variance is you simply take the uh, difference between those two values and then you square it, and that gives you uh, variance in terms of millimetres squared. And so the first of those modifiers I talked about, which comes from the road surface, we're really looking at, okay, what's the effect of the, uh, the magnitude within the road profile? The reason why this was important is because Variance is uh, very good at looking at the frequency of vibrations. You can imagine that um, when you vary your moving average length, what you're essentially doing is you're targeting different ranges of of um, variation, different ranges of variation within your road surface. And so that's important, as we mentioned before, because of the different wheelbase length between cars and trucks. So what we were aiming to do was to choose a moving average length, which allowed us to really target the the wavelengths, uh, the profile, road profile wavelengths, which are really uh, impacting more on um, trucks rather than cars. And so that's fine, but that really leaves aside this issue of the magnitude. A road profile surface can have identical um, fre uh, frequency to another um, in terms of the wavelengths, etc. but then the amount of uh, the rise and fall can actually be different. The, uh, the amplitude of the wavelengths can be quite different. And so this was an attempt to be able to measure the, the, the amplitude of the wavelengths that were present. And so what we did was we simply looked for the maximum and minimum height within a certain distance as indicated by the uh, LM here. And this value we decided to use as 25 metres, uh, this being because when you're travelling at uh, 90 kilometres per hour or 25 metres per second, um, 25 metres is representing one second of experience, and so we're using that as the, uh, as the, the base value for it. So even if you're travelling at 100 or at 80 kilometres per hour, it's still not that different. So um, we decided that uh, one second of experience was a good way of, a good resolution to have in terms of looking at the experience uh, of those vibrations that's felt by the driver. And so what this chart on the right is showing is simply the difference between the maximum and minimum at each 25 uh, metre point in the road. And so what that shows here is that at this part of the road, the, the driver will be experiencing like, larger, um, larger vertical uh, movements than they will at, at this point in the road. So even though they both fell over one, one second, over here we expect that this will be a much rougher experience of the road because the bumps are bigger basically. And that's really what we we're trying to capture, the size of the, of the bump. And so, um, with that, Ron, just really as an example, um, this shows you that the general roughness model we chose was variance, as we discussed, to really target the uh, to really target the the frequencies that were being of the vibrations that were being experienced. And so, for the general modifiers, we were looking at the magnitude, as I just explained, and also the speed. We actually did a, a separate um, data collection in the town of Saint Arno or Saint Arnold as the locals like to call it, um, where we're looking at the effect of speed, where we took one vehicle and we basically ran it over the same roads at different speeds. And we found, of course, that speed does make a, uh, does have an impact. As you can imagine, if you come into a set of vibrations at a high speed, there's more energy involved, and so that did have an effect. And so those two things did go into, um, into these general modifiers. And so finally, the quality modifiers, uh, these are ones which are unique to the vehicles, we want to find out, okay, worry about the susceptibility to lateral vibrations. Are some vehicle configurations more subject to the side-to-side -side rocking? Um, the moving average length for variance, that gets back to um, with the frequencies that you are selecting from the road surface through variance. Obviously, the, well, the, the moving average length you select will mean different results, one being rougher than the other. Um, and so therefore, which do you choose for your, your different models? And finally, out of all of that, you get numbers, and then how do you interpret those numbers? Because uh, obviously you want the, the leaden vehicle model to be a lot more sensitive to the vibrations and to produce a rougher uh, indication of ride than you do for the, the golden vehicle. So the question then is, how do you interpret the numbers that you get out of this process? And so firstly, looking at the first of those, the uh, susceptibility to lateral vibration, I've just got some results here from two vehicles that we tested, um, both unloaded, so you can see that the, 
uh, in these charts, we have a different colour for each of the vibrations in each, each of the directions. And so looking at lateral vibrations, what we're looking at here is a vibration in the, the, in the y-axis, which you can see is shown in green. And so for the semi-trailer, you can see the lateral vibrations are not really that different to the vibrations in the other directions. Whereas for the rigid truck, you can see they are very different. So um, you can see that the lateral vibrations were very, very high compared to the others. Uh, it's interesting to note that you can see the values here. So the values for the vibrations for the semi-trailer and for the rigid truck, they're both, the base level is around the same, but then the response in the lateral direction is a lot, lot higher for the rigid truck, indicating that this vehicle type definitely does not handle lateral vibrations very well and in fact has the highest susceptibility to lateral vibration. So that's another reason why, and in fact, that is the main reason why the rigid truck is such a good candidate for um, being the leaden vehicle. And so how do you sort of quantify that and turn that into numbers? The way we did that was, once again, because remember we don't have an accelerometer in every vehicle, what we're looking for is we want to be able to look at the road profile and then out of that be able to take some way to represent that susceptibility. And so the way we did that was by looking at the change in the uh, difference in the wheel path between different points on the road. So you can see as shown in this graphic here, where travel is from left to right. Uh, at this point, there's quite a big difference, and then it goes to a less of a, less of a difference between the two wheel parts. So what that means is there's going to be a, a lateral movement as the, the truck tilts, in this case, from the right to the left. And so this formula here simply measures how much tilt there is between two, uh, to, uh, oh, sorry, at a, at a point along the road. And then finally, this formula here simply says, OK, what was the, the change in the angle? between the two wheel paths as I moved along the road. And so when you plot that up, you get a result similar to this, where you can see that the some parts of the road do have a, a higher kind of uh, change, higher lateral vibration factor than others. And so what is actually showing is not whether or not there's a difference between the wheel paths, but more how rapidly that uh, difference is changing. And so at some points along the road like, like this, uh, for example, this is a good point, you can see here that uh, the elevation of the two wheel paths is quite different, but there's not a lot of rapid change, and so therefore the result is low. Whereas you come over here, you can see here, in fact, that they look like they're quite level, but there is quite swift change there as you come down to this point, so here, therefore you're getting quite a large response. And so what we do with this is we'd say that, okay, this is the amount of lateral vibration, and then we'll apply a factor, which is this one, the Y, for the gold or the linen vehicle to say that this, which would basically allow us to, if you like, weight the effect of this. And so in the golden vehicle, we say, yes, the golden vehicle handles this very well, so why not would be a small number. The leaden vehicle doesn't handle it so well, so this will be a large number, which will amplify the effect of this on the final result. Um, Ulysses, we've just had a question come through. Sorry to cut you off there. Um, the question is from Rosie, and she'd like to know if... Um, oh, with reference to lateral uh, vibration, whether some lateral vibration might be wind. Yes, uh, some of it definitely would be because uh, the side of the vehicle is, is very much like a like a sail. You can see here, there's a lot of surface area there for the wind to, to blow against. Uh, more particularly, if it's gusting wind, that's producing a lot of, uh, uh, if you like, uh, gusts. You know, gusty wind. Yeah, gusts, absolutely. <laughs> uh, which is basically rocking the vehicle back and forth. Um, but as far as the um, an asset manager in a road agency or local council is concerned, they don't control the wind, they can't do anything about the wind, so sure. all they're really looking at is you know, what's the effect of this on, uh, uh, on what are the effects based on the road surface only, because that's really their only level of responsibility. So yes, it does have an effect, but they that's really not what we're can't thinking. take that into yeah, account. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm glad to say that on those, those days where we were doing that testing for two weeks in Dubbo, yeah. there was basically no wind. It was very <laughs> hot and still, and so there was no wind influencing the results. So um, getting back to this moving average length for variance, what we're looking for here is uh, the question, what's the best moving average length that's going to best represent the experience of a vehicle that performs well on the road as compared to one that doesn't perform very well? And so what you can see here, um, just showing the difference between the the wheelbase length for a rigid truck and then the prime mover of an articulated vehicle. So you can see the rigid truck is slightly longer. 
So what that means is it's going to experience a, a larger range of, of wavelengths. And you may think that um, the difference between these two is not all that great, but um, we did some um, testing in our, our models to look at the difference of just one meter difference between the, of the moving average length, and we found that it is quite significant. So that's why uh, within the model we decided to use five and six meters um, as a difference between the golden and the leaden vehicle. And that did produce uh, a, a significant result. And so uh, the purpose of that is really to target uh, different ranges of, um, of wavelengths. Obviously, the shorter vehicle you have, the less, less range of wavelengths you are exposed to. And so uh, the less uh, variation that your vehicle experiences, so the less vibration that the driver will experience. So then we come to the matter of interpreting the results that we get. So after we take the road profile, we apply the moving average, we calculate the variance, we introduce those factors for the speed and for the magnitude of the vibrations on the road. Then uh, we go through all those uh, modifiers that are related to the, the golden vehicle and the leaden vehicle. And finally, we produce uh, a number. But then we still need to interpret it a little bit further because what this uh, line here is showing is a single value which comes from the road profile. So remember, we're trying to produce a roughness band. At this stage, uh, we, we still have a single uh, single value which is only different because of that moving average shift. So there would actually be two lines here, but that'd still be quite close. And what we're looking for is to produce a little bit more uh, difference between two to really capture the difference in the experience between driving the two different very types, two very different types of vehicle. And so what we do is we simply take one value and we say for the golden vehicle it represents this range of experience and then for the lens vehicle it represents this range of experience. So the one value is interpreted very differently between the two models. And so once that happens for um, either the leaden vehicle or the golden vehicle, you would then produce uh, numbers that you would then allocate to these comfort bins as we see here. So these five bins here are just what is indicated by the particular model that you're using, going from very comfortable to ex uh, extremely uncomfortable. And so, uh, for example, these two points here, they both fall within this range. Um, and so when you put it in the bin, it's just regarded as being in that bin, so we're not so concerned with the, the amount of uh, difference between those two values because a lot of these experiences are very subjective and so these comfort bins really represent, if you like, differences in experience which are perceptible to the driver, which are able to be uh, are realistic because different people will respond in different ways to different levels of vibration. Of course. And so we can't be too too particular when we're getting into too much detail about that. And so. What happens then is over the length of 100 metres, we would then uh, basically uh, count how many, uh, of what's the proportion of the vibrations falling into the different comfort bins. And that gives us these values here. And then finally, uh, all these weighting factors are simply to produce an uh, index which varies between 0 and, and 10, where uh, 10 is a, a road that's really, really rough, and 0 is a road which is perfectly smooth. Um, so as you can imagine, you wouldn't get too many zeros. And in fact, hopefully we wouldn't get too many tens either. So it's really just a, a scale of one to ten, sorry, zero to ten, which is quite easy for people to relate to. And so this is uh, an example of the results that we found. Um, so this is showing just uh, just one kilometer of, of road. And so the thing to remember about the results that are shown here is that all of these dots, these are the results of the ride quality as measured by the vibrations in the seat pad. And these lines here are produced by our two models, which are not based on those vibrations at all, but are based on the road profile. And so what happens here is that we're bringing together two pieces of data from different sources and interpreting them in such a way that they're trying to represent the same thing. Because as I've said before, the, uh, the asset manager in the road authority or local council, they will not have all these dots they will only have these two lines. And so what we're looking for is to produce two lines that will capture or envelope all of the dots. And so you can see that we've done pretty well for most, most of it. Um, during this section here, you can see that the two lines are capturing uh, the majority of the experience of all the vehicles. And so what that means is that yes, we are, for this part of the road, capturing the worst experience and the, the best experience. And so that's a very, very positive sign. Over here, in fact, though it's not so good, you can see here 
is an area where it's been the model is saying that um, it's possible to experience a much higher uh, quality of ride than was actually experienced by the vehicle. Like uh, even over here as well, this is a little bit worse than we would um, like it to be. And so what this means is that there are some of the factors uh, related to the heavy vehicle on the road that we have not fully understood yet, or perhaps we need to um, do more variations in our vehicles or look at um, different roads to be able to really try and uh, tease out some of those differences that may have been you know, hidden away within the, um, the particular circumstances of the vehicles and roads that we chose. So what this means is um, the conclusion is that we have you know, determined a range of responses for various vehicle types, configurations and loading, uh, and that allows us to really get an understanding of, uh, if you like, the candidates for the golden and the leaden model. And so going on from here, we will want to do more testing, more sophisticated testing with more instrumentation on our uh, vehicles and to really, um, I suppose, get more, understand what's happening with the, vi with the vibrations as they move through the vehicle uh, in greater detail and to increase our understanding of that. And so that will allow us to refine this tool and to produce something which uh, can more accurately represent the range of experience on the road um, from or road, the range of experiences that our heavy vehicle drivers have. So at this stage, are we looking at doing some more work in the near future on, a, on this project, or is it um, perhaps something that's taken a back seat <laughs> for the moment? It was. Uh, this research was done a couple of years ago, um, um, but I was just. Uh, uh, Tim Martin, for example, has been very uh, supportive of this and he recognises that we've done half the work so we really need to do the other half to produce something useful. Um, and he's, so he's been very supportive of this uh, at the Assets Task Force and other, in other areas. And he just told me yesterday, in fact, that um, there could be some funding coming in the near future for oh, this. Okay. So um, it is possible that we'll be able to continue this work. Oh, fantastic. We can run another webinar then so the audience can stay tuned for part two hopefully coming soon. <laughs> um, we do have a question from Rod. Thank you, Rod, for your question. Um, any thoughts on that, Ulysses? Um, I'm not sure what he's actually asking there. Um, what what if you wouldn't mind um, perhaps clarifying your question a little bit further and we'll get on to answering that for you. And if, of course, there are any other pending questions, please send them through or uh, if perhaps something comes to mind after the webinar, we'll be happy to uh, discuss those with you. I'm sure uh, Ulysses would be very happy to, to have those discussions with you. Perhaps the answer to the question is that um, all the vibrations that are presented today were measured in the CPAD, so they were measured uh, at the point where it enters the driver's body, which is in accordance with the Australian standard on vibrations. Uh, and so they were mostly measured at the, whatever height that the, the seat was above the road surface. And that does definitely have an effect on uh, the, the experience. You can imagine your car where you're so close to the, right, the road surface, the amount of rocking from side to side you experience is going to be a lot less than if you're in an elevated position on a truck. And in fact, that high seat position is one of the main reasons why heavy vehicles experience a much rougher ride in a car. Ah, fair enough. Good answer. And thank you, Rod, for your clarification on that question there. Okay. Um, the, the road profile was all measured within the, the wheel pass of the vehicle. Um, and so uh, that would have been uh, the standard, you know, approximately 2 metres or 2.1 metres uh, that we use in all, all the, the road surveying. So I hope, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you, Rod. And it uh, looks like we have a bit of a quiet audience today, but that's okay. As I said, uh, you can always get in touch with us post-webinar um, if you've got some more questions. And um, as I mentioned earlier on in the webinar, we will be sending out a link to the recording of this webinar. So if there's anything you want to uh, watch over again, you can do that. And of course, anyone that missed out can also catch up again today. Uh, thank you everyone for your time today. I'd like to thank Ulysses for making the time to come and present this webinar. Uh, it is the first for the year so that can be a little bit daunting but I think he's done a wonderful job. So thank you Ulysses. I hope this won't be your, your last webinar. And um, thank you all for joining us. We hope you can join us next time as well. Thank you and bye for now.
The organizer has ended the session and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.